Thank you. Right. Good morning, everyone, and first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you have a great day and that we are able to convey some excitement uh, and excited about what we do here and the opportunities that we can offer you, and we hope that you uh, apply and come to study here. My name is Pedro Ramos Pinto. Uh, I'm I teach in international economic history here at Cambridge. I've done so for about 10 years. Before that, I was at, at Manchester. Um, and what I'm going to do today is give you a three, sort of three-part session over the next hour. So first, I'm going to give you a little taste of the kind of things we teach in our first year. Uh, I'm going to use some of the things I do. And as Caroline was saying in response to one of your questions, it is about a different perspective than perhaps you might have had uh, in your school career so far. In it that we are trying in this course that I teach, which is uh, the 20th century world, we're trying to approach many familiar uh, instances that you might have come across, be it you know, the question of violence and genocide in the Second World War, questions of protests, feminism in the 1960s and 70s or other aspects of 20th century uh, world history, but which you might have approached from the perspective of American history or of uh, European history, we are trying to set them in a global context and trying to see what happens when we take that different lens and open up a whole new set of questions. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that um, in the first 20 minutes. And then I'm going to give you a, a more of a kind of factual presentation about our three degrees, history, history in modern languages, and history in politics, with the various routes and options through them. And then hopefully uh, we'll have plenty of time over 20 minutes uh, for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to start with something that is perhaps familiar. Uh, if, if, you, if you ever looked in your larder at home, or you might have you might enjoy cooking yourself, which um, I'm not from, from the UK. I moved here although quite a few years ago, and this was something new to me, this institution called uh, uh, the OXO Cube. Is everyone familiar with the OXO Cube? For those that aren't, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a stock cube, something you dissolve in water to give flavor to your stews, or you can have as a drink. You know, it is marketed and always has as quite quintessentially British, uh, you see here uh, a poster uh, put out by OXO during the First World War where a soldier is writing home, sort of talking uh, about the restorative and homely properties of this drink. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of patriotic, you know, this view of, of uh, the trenches, which is perhaps a little bit um, uh, green-tinted, if not uh, rose-tinted. Um, we know that the OXO cube started in the second half of the 19th century, uh, manufactured by, as, as Lemco, uh, and then by 1899, it was now trademarked as OXO, and it was used, it was, it was sold to uh, the forces during World War I and used across the world. Is it then a quintessential British brand? And this is where I want to start, because what I want to do over the next 20 minutes is to try and do two things to talk a little bit about how, for instance, we talk about economic history, which I hope you don't uh, uh, immediately recoil from and think of something that's only about uh, percentages and numbers, because the way I teach it, the way I'm interested about it, is trying to think about the relationship between economics, between economic processes, between production, consumption, and people's lives, people's everyday lives, political questions, and questions that cut across society in, in multiple ways. So I'm going to use, I want to start from the Oxo Cube to start telling that story. Because what I want to, we can start from a simple little cube of meat extract, and we can ask a number of important questions. And the ones I think where we can start is really about how did capitalism, how did trade, how did empire shape not just the early 20th century, but what was to come over the following 100 years. And, and this is tied up with the emergence of a global economy. Not to say that globalization is something that only happens in the 20th century, uh, or even in the 21st century. We have had, over the course of history, 
many different instances when different parts of the world came closer together, where people, ideas, cultures, and products have uh, brought these places together, and other, part, other times in history where those links have become longer or they severed entirely. But the late 19th century going into the beginning of the 20th century is one of those moments in which the world is becoming smaller. And it's becoming smaller for a variety of reasons, which we'll go into in a bit. So let's go back to the Oxo cube. That quintessentially British product is actually invented by a German chemist who touts it around uh, different parts of Europe, trying to find an investor until he finds an investor in London, which at the time, as the heart of the largest empire of the time, is where capital, where money is concentrated, and where he thinks he can find uh, someone to, and he does find someone to help him patent it and market it. So that's when uh, Lemco is founded in 1865 in London, which is at the time the economic and financial capital of the world. So maybe this could be just a story of a product invented by a German becoming British, you know, fairly local. But actually, most of it is made in a factory all the way down in Uruguay. Uh, a factory founded by uh, British capital with some South American capital, which takes, of course, at this stage, what's happening is that lots of Latin America, which had long been colonized by European powers, particularly Spain and Portugal. But at this time, there's a new impetus that the demand for meat, the demand for cereals, the demand for other products is opening up new frontiers to exploitation uh, in, in Latin America and South America. The very environment, deforestation, and also the uh, violence against indigenous people who had occupied those lands is very much a feature of this period in order to, in this case, uh, to clear land for uh, cattle that's then going to be used uh, in uh, the factory in Uruguay. By the way, does anyone here know, uh, has ever seen, or perhaps has had the misfortune of tasting something called a Frey Bento's pie? The next time you're in the kind of canned goods, uh, um, the canned goods section of a supermarket, look for a Frey Bento spy. Perhaps in your corner shop, they're more likely to be found there these days. But it's a very popular product. Um, and it's actually uh, manufactured in the same place that makes the Oxo Cube, which is actually a town called Frey Bento's that's created and takes on lots of migrant labor coming from Europe and other parts of the world in order to work the cattle and process it into all these different kind of products that then can be shipped around the world. Because actually, the, the extract of meat uh, is not, uh, is not um, finalized in, in Uruguay. It goes all the way back to Europe, to Antwerp, for Botka. Now, this is beginning to look a lot more familiar to us when we hear today of product uh, and production chains that span across the globe, like our phones that are half made in China with, uh, with minerals that are extracted in Africa and then are finished off in Europe or in, in the USA. This is a process that's also happening with different products in the early 19th century. Uh, but think about, it. in order for this to happen, a lot of things have to go in the background. A lot of people have to move a lot of, uh, money has to move, a lot of ideas have to be mobilized in order to create something that is working and spans all around the globe. And this is what's happening. And one of the things that's facilitating this is, of course, the domination of European empires who have overcome earlier imperial formations, including those of China and elsewhere, in order to become really the dominant political and economic forces in the globe at this time. Uh, different, the leading economies, Britain, France, Germany, and to a certain extent, the US, have, have come into agreement to make gold essentially the single currency, which is making it easier for people to 
take money they have in Britain and invest in, Euro in plants in Uruguay. Um, and there's also a technological revolution that is helping this uh, spread of trade and production across the world. Things like the laying of transatlantic telegraph cables that allow you to, to send orders to Latin America in a way that um, you can do so in seconds rather than waiting for months for a, for a ship. And if you think about it, that's really important because you need to tell your factory in Uruguay that actually you don't need them to make as many uh, oxo tubes or perhaps you need them to increase production. Uh, and also transport, the steamship, uh, steel hulled steamships, and great engineering pro projects like the Suez Canal that was completed in 1869. But of course, someone has to dig it. Someone has to pay for it. There's French and British capitals are, are, are mobilized. Uh, there are political implications. There is pressure put on uh, uh, Egyptian authorities that become a protectorate to allow this. And of course, it's uh, laborers from Egypt and from elsewhere in the Middle East and Africa that will dig it by hand. Uh, so there's human labor, there's human blood that goes into the making of these communication routes. But if you think that today's world is unequal, and it is, think about at this time the domination of European empires as such that of all the capital, all the money invested outside uh, outside of borders of individual countries, uh, a staggering 87% of it is coming from Europe. And that is primarily from Britain, France, and Germany. So even the US is far behind on this. In fact, uh, the US, uh, US companies, US investors are, are looking for loans from Europe at this time to invest in their own uh, expansion. And what this is allowing is a full globalization of production of new products that are make, transforming lives, particularly of people who, in the richer parts of the world, which at the time are, are in Europe. Uh, new goods that have become completely, um, that have been around perhaps since the 17th century, since the discovery of, of the new world, but are now being available to people even on lower incomes. Coffee and cocoa for instance, become staples that even working class families working in mills in the north of England uh, can afford. Bread becomes cheaper because it's being planted in vast uh, parts of uh, East Central Europe, but also in vast parts of the US, uh, which is uh, now getting connected into the world economy. Uh, rubber extraction from um, South America, and of course, cotton production, uh, in, 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 which is feeding the textile mills in the US and of, of Northern Europe. And there's also been a shift. If in the 18th and early 19th century, a lot of this labor, particularly in cotton and northern things, was done by slaves, in the tens of, by the tens of millions of people who were forcibly transported, particularly from Western Africa, into the Americas, South and North, uh, with the abolition of slavery, that institution, particularly after the end of the American Civil War, that institution has uh, essentially declined. The last areas to, to abolish it were probably Brazil in the 1880s, where it remained where, until later. But there are other forms of exploitation of labor that are almost as, as bad as slavery, and which a lot of this globalization relies on. Uh, for instance, indentured labor, labor, something that we still see today that we, we read about in, when we talk about modern day trafficking and slavery, where laborers are forced to pay for their passage and for their board, but at such high rates that it, essentially they remain slaves until they're able to pay off these debts uh, for a long time. And that is the way in which millions of people are moved around the globe to facilitate, to make possible this uh, production. And the numbers are quite staggering, particularly when we start thinking about the kinds of numbers we worry about in, 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 long, uh, in, in migrations in uh, at present are, are pale in comparison to the mass movement of people uh, across the, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Uh, almost 60 million people 
moved from Europe to the Americas. This is particularly from East and Central Europe, but also from places like Ireland and elsewhere, into not just our stories uh, that we get from films, uh, for instance, about Italian migrants into North America. Actually, one thing that we don't often realize is that more Italians move to South America, to Argentina, to Brazil, and to other parts of that continent, which where the, the, the borders of, of, of uh, agriculture, of ex, ex, exploiting minerals, etc., were expanding, then moved to North America and to New York. Also, many from uh, Asia to, particularly from the, to the west coast uh, of America. But also, there's a mass movement of people across Southeast Asia, particularly from China and India, into the areas in Southeast Asia and Malaysia, where tea, coffee, and rubber are demanding and sucking labor uh, into, into those areas. And of course, across what is across Central Asia, across the Russian Empire, uh, and attempts to colonize uh, large parts of that uh, of that area, you also see these mass movements of people. This is really uh, unprecedented in, in global history and has not been seen in this scale since. Now. Towards the end of this period I've been focusing on, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, we've got, of course, the break that comes with uh, the Great War, that we now call the First World War. And this is one of the things that I think in our course perhaps we do that's different, is that we try to see the effects and how this process works if you look at it uh, globally. Not only if you look at the collapse of Russia and Germany, but if you also consider what happens and the consequences of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the redrawing of the boundaries of the Middle East that come from that. Uh, what happens just before as the, the Qing Empire, the Qing Empire in China is, is forced to collapse from the, in, in part by the pressures put upon them by European empires and by Japanese uh, expansion. And really how new players emerge uh, around this time, particularly Japan and the United States as great powers, but also how it affects every region of the world and how people from all over the world, from the West Indies to South Asia, to mass, uh, to uh, large uh, conflicts connected to the First World War that took place in Africa that we rarely hear about, and what the consequences of this were globally. Well, one of those consequences is how the, or the global order and the global hierarchy is subverted. Essentially, the great European powers of Britain, Germany, and France spend all their capital literally blowing up each other uh, and throwing their men at each other with millions of casualties, as we know. And who are who benefits from this? Well, those other emerging economies that were, to a large extent, or until very late, out of the conflict. The United States emerges as the leading exporter and the leading lender of capital to the US. And that generates a whole new form of, uh, of uh, relationship between, on, on both sides of the Atlantic, where now the US is the leading partner. The US, instead of building tanks, and guns has moved forward in terms of technology, and particularly in mass consumer technology, something that's also changed in societies as we speak. We have here an example of, this is a Ford Model T, the first mass, uh, um, mass produced car that was also relatively affordable for an ordinary family, and that was the first model of car that millions of people buy and also that they're buying on credit, something we are now quite familiar with. Um, and that means that so a lot of the European economy becomes dependent on the loans coming from the US, but also a lot of the world is now depending on what is now the world's richest nation, which is also very large in terms of population, is consuming from the rest of the world. And that, of course, becomes unsettled. Uh, after something that starts in the US but then spreads across the world. 
Uh, and this is the stock market crash of 1929 that we all have heard about. But one thing we have to trace and think about is how does a stock market crash in the US, uh, which yes, of course, triggers a depression. We've all uh, seen uh, and read Steinbeck uh, and those kinds of, of descriptions of the Great Depression in the US. But how and why does it spread over several years until we have uh, a deep uh, recession, a crisis emerging in Europe, particularly in Austria, Austria and in Germany, which ends up in bank runs and people sort of trying desperately to get their money out, and a dramatic rise in unemployment that can own that is linked, uh, doesn't fully explain, but it's also deeply linked to something else that is going to dramatically change the shape of the world in the following years, which is of course the rise of Nazism. Can we explain the rise of Hitler and the popularity? of the Nazi party, which had just 10 years before really been a, a, a fairly inconsequential group of essentially nutters uh, shouting in Germany, going to become the, the, the most voted party in the 1932 elections. And you see a poster here from that campaign from the Nazi party, the group of unemployed men, uh, where it reads, um, Hitler, our last hope. So that context, that economic context about a crisis that goes all the way back to the First World War, to the reorganization of the global economy, that, that allows then the spread of an American-made crisis into Europe and other parts of the world, because there are uh, other parts of the world producing goods for America, producing consumer products for, for America and Europe, where you also have very high unemployment, where you have rising conflict, uh, where you have labor strikes in West Africa against colonial powers, where you have the beginnings of uh, uh, much stronger anti-colonial sentiments driven by agricultural depression and rising prices really all over the world, uh, stemming from, from that stock market crash in the US. What we're trying to highlight is really how these things connect and how at that point we then find we find ourselves in the new crossroads where so much of what was taken as uh, the guiding way in which politics society and the economy should be run which had been dominated by a globalized form of liberalism is now facing real alternatives and real choices. They're going to define much of the rest of the 20th century. That is, of course, on one hand, the kinds of new liberalism, the reinvented liberalism that we see with Keynes uh, in Britain, with the Roosevelt's New Deal in America, a new form of capitalism that ha allows a certain degree of state intervention and is beginning to make use of tools such as welfare and social policy to moderate extremes of capitalism. But you have the other extremes. You have the communist alternative that we now see as a failed economic project, but in the 1930s looked like a model for many countries affected by uh, unemployment, by recession, and by the consequences of a capitalist crisis. And of course, the kinds of fascism that it, Italy and Germany embraced that, um, again, through a different means, through economic nationalism, also known as autarky, were promising the working man and the working woman a new future that they argued was going to be more prosperous than what liberalism had been able to deliver. Uh, so the questions we really want to ask with this is, how does this change if we look at it then globally? What are the ties, for instance, between colonialism, empire, and the, and the rise of extremist nationalism in Europe. What's the connection between a globalizing economy where economic shocks travel at great speed through great distances? What are, those, what are the consequences for, of that for, for, for the world? Um, and particularly, where do ordinary people fit into this? I've been talking about very big processes, about canals, about telegraphs, about money moving across the world, in at great speed, 
But ultimately, what we have to think about all these processes is that they only work if there are people, if there are hands, if there are bodies behind it. Those canals don't dig themselves. That cotton doesn't pick itself. Uh, those bridges and those railways do not build themselves. They are built by people. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're forced. Many times they die in doing so. When people in the roaring 20s in the US or in Europe are drinking uh, uh, coffee or enjoying the, you know, we often study in social history, for instance, the, the rise of um, consumer fashion, the flapper in the 1920s. Those cottons, those patterns are made somewhere by, some, by someone. How are those things connected and what are the implications of that for how we should think about those processes? What we want to ask you to do in your degrees. So I hope that was a little taster of what we do. It's mostly about questions. The way we teach is not, hopefully, to give you answers, but opening up questions that then, in your own time, in your essays, in your reading, you're going to explore and come up with your own perspectives and your own, uh, your own answers. For instance, in this kind of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of freedom for people to... We, we give you these big background, big surveys of what's happening, but through the reading and through the direction of a supervisor, you could be free to explore these questions in any setting that you want. So, for instance, I'm really interested in exploring what happens in Latin America during the Great Depression. Or, actually, could I look at a question of migration not through looking at uh, the migration of, of Eastern, from Eastern Europe to America, but could I look at Southeast Asia instead? Meaning that there's never one way to come through a course and answer these questions. And you are free to follow your own interests. I hope that's what we're trying to create. And I hope that's why our courses are exciting. And I hope that's also what's brought you here. Thank you. So now, what will this look in practice if you were doing uh, your degree? So first of all, why do, you know, what use is going to be knowing what OXO, what the history of the OXO cube is once you get out of university? What exactly are you learning? What exactly are we trying uh, to teach you? Well, I certainly am not trying to teach you facts and dates and things like that. You are very intelligent, you're very able, you've proven this throughout your, your school careers, you are perfectly able to find those out by yourself. What I'm hoping that we can do here is, is develop your critical thinking, your ability to research, your ability to assess information, your ability to weigh arguments, and, and also how to develop your own analytical skills and your own presentation skills. Uh, once you do that, how can you write it, present it orally? How can you convey complex ideas in language that is accessible and not too jargon heavy? How can you use thinking about the past to think about anything, not just the past? If you, if you want to get on, go on and be a historian, fantastic. But if you want to use these critical skills, they are essential in anything you're going to do in your life. And I hope that's what we can give you. And this is why what we structured our, our degree about is taking you through uh, those... We don't expect you, of course, to know how to do this when you arrive. You've been trained in a slightly different model, which is about uh, answering questions for A-level exams. We are now helping you through developing those skills at a different level uh, and, and to a greater level. Because yes, we do want you to gain skills and we do want you to get a job when, when you get out. And I hope that what you're finding today is that we have the facilities and the teaching staff to help you in, in the best way. Um, you've seen all these things. Uh, university rankings are worth what they're worth. Um, probably the differences between who's in second, third, or fourth, or first are, are very minimal. 
also, you also know what place seems to suit you better, and I, I, and I would say that's no, uh, that's more important than, than the rankings. That said, I'm quite pleased that we are on the top of the rankings. Uh, one of the great advantages of being possibly one of the largest, if not the largest, history faculty in, in the UK, and also, you know, comparing, I don't think there's many in the world that are, are this, uh, are this, have got this many members of staff, is that we can offer a, a almost unparalleled range, both chronologically and methodologically and papers from antiquity through to the modern day. And we have a focus on letting you and encouraging you to work directly with primary sources of material from the past. Um, and you also will be able to, from really from the beginning, but increasingly in the second and third year, to develop your own research project. And every year I read fantastic final year dissertations, uh, which quite a few of them have gone on to be published as academic articles uh, uh, eventually. Um, and this is just some examples of the kinds of primary sources that are available, because also we have one of the world's leading research libraries and multiple archives in Cambridge, which our students use on a daily basis. Uh, the University Library, which you can see just over there, the, the sort of overgrown TARDIS uh, uh, that you can see to, to our north, uh, has a huge collection of books, manuscripts, and sources going all the way back to uh, 5000 BC to, to the present. And those are open for any student to look at. Uh, those include modern collections and archives. This is a photo from the, the reading room of the, the manuscripts reading room of the, the university library. And many of my students end up doing dissertations where they're working for the first time with, with documents in there. We also have modern things like the Churchill Archive at Churchill College, where the papers of Winston Churchill and of many leading 20th century British politicians are deposited. Again, you know, where else can you go and handle the letters sent by Churchill, by Thatcher, by Macmillan, by all the leading figures of 20th century British politics. But we also have access to a huge range of other materials online from archives around the world that the university pays for our researchers and students to have access to. And we have, as I was saying, a range of faculty that, that is uh, unparalleled. This is, you know, I'm gonna run through some of them Peter Mander, Alex Walsham, and Lucy Lapp, working on very different things in British history, uh, cultural history, the history of the Reformation. Uh, the, this great book by Lucy is on the history of domestic service in 20th century Britain. Uh, that chap on the, on the left is, is highly recommended, but you also have uh, great work by Caroline, who we just met, uh, Mary Lavin, our current chair of faculty, who's Written a groundbreaking work on uh, um, sort of popular religiosity in early modern um, um, Italy. Or I'm sure you've come across uh, uh, the Regis Professor, Christopher Clark, his work on how Europe went to war, war in 1914. Or even more excitingly, the book is just published that you might see in bookshops about the, again, the, the, the cross-national, transnational experience of revolution in 1848 in Europe. But we also have a, a great number of colleagues working well beyond the borders of Britain and Europe. Uh, on Southeast Asia, Rachel Liao, who, with who I co-organized the, the, the course on 20th century world history. Um, Sujit's brilliant book on uh, revolution and empire in the 18th century from a global perspective. Um, Shamita Sen, who works on South Asian history across a variety of topics, uh, and um, Hank, John Henry Gonzalez, who works on um, Caribbean history, as well as we've got colleagues working on African history, American history, Chinese history. It is really a, 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 a wide-ranging uh, faculty. But we also have a very strong tradition in the history of political thought, in intellectual history. Just some examples, uh, Richard Bork's uh, book on Burke uh, and Annabel Brett's history of uh, nature, sort of thinking about law and nature in, in a long uh, run perspective. And last but not least, 
we have also strength in, in the burgeoning field of environmental history. Just two examples here, Paul Ward's brilliant invention of sustainability and Gareth Austin's work on economic development and winters. So, and this, we all like teaching both survey courses and courses that are much closer to our own expertise, which is what you tend to do towards the end of, of your degree. So, and that's one of the most enjoyable things of teaching in a place like this, is when you get brilliant students like you engaging with the same questions that we are trying to, to answer in our own work. Okay, so how is this done in practice? Well, I'm going to run you through first the history degree and then show you the others. We organize our degree in three strands. Uh, historical knowledge, craft of history, which is really about the, the making, and historical thinking, which is more about the theories behind how we approach the past. In your first year, we divide the, the year in three terms. Uh, you really, the, the, uh, what you see is the bulk of your work would be on two, uh, uh, sorry, this is 1B, should be 1A, sorry. Uh, 1A, which is the first year, the bulk of your work would be on these outlines. One of them being the 20th century world I described, I'll show you the others as well. Along that, uh, along that, alongside that, you have a series of lectures on skills, that is, how historians, what kind of techniques historians use, how, how to navigate an archive, how to work with quantification, uh, for instance. And also, then, something that's more college-based, which is the opportunity to engage deeply with one single book as a group in your college to think about how historians go from idea to resources to analysis to presentation in, in depth. Throughout this time, you're having lectures, you're having seminars, and then you're having the small group supervisions. Uh, and there is, and most of the assessment takes place in, in the Eastern. Uh, in part 1b, you move the content of the courses that you take becomes more specific, and there's more of them to choose from. Those are the topic papers, which are taught by a variety of lectures and supervisions, and a research project, which is a sort of long essay uh, where you are free, you've got a great freedom to choose your, your topic and research it, supported by seminars and by supervision, which is in a way kind of foretaste of a final year dissertation. So you can practice that style of engagement before submitting. And we continue looking through historical thinking. And here, thinking about key questions about how theories of knowledge and history, how do we approach uh, history uh, from the perspective of gender? How can we think about the environment in history, the Anthropocene in history? Those are the kinds of themes that structure historical thinking one be. Uh, in part two, that's the final year, uh, students choose, uh, depending on whether they do a dissertation or not, choose one or two advanced topics, which are again sort of focused uh, papers, but that often have, you have papers in African history, in Latin American history, uh, on Chinese history. And then one of the sort of crowning jewels of our degree is a special subject. That is a... Um, a course where in a group of around 15, you'll be engaging with primary sources in, in a concerted way throughout the year. There will be, you know, it might be looking at Albrecht Dürer and the making of the Renaissance. It might be looking at uh, the, the history of the Ottoman court, or it could be um, looking at, um, I'm trying to think, I'll go through the list later, but in a way you get to engage deeply with your favorite topic uh, through sources leading to, to an exam in coursework. And there's of course the dissertation, which is optional, but that a large majority of our students take, because by that stage you really want to get your hands into your own topics. And students travel all over the world to do research, they do research on amazing topics, um, and it, it's one part of the degree that is entirely your own. You know, the achievement of completing this degree is entirely your own, but this is the one bit of it that's yours from start to finish. And that is also accompanied by historical thinking, where we continue 
to uh, have classes and supervisions on thinking about how to approach history and thinking about theory and thinking about methods. Okay, um, this is uh, an example of, of the outlines that, and these are available in different combinations to students across all three degrees. So these are the first, uh, in the first year, the core, where people choose two, one early, one late. And you can see they span uh, great longer chronologies, but they also span large parts of the globe. Europe and the world, uh, the global 18th century, and uh, the global south from 1750 to the present day. And did I, is there something missing here? Oh, we don't yet have, we don't, we don't seem to have on this slide, sorry, the, the second year topics. Uh, but this is, I was talking earlier about the special subjects, those were focused very much on source places, and those are some examples. Memory in early modern England, uh, the Ottoman court one that I was looking at, the 1848 Revolutions by Chris Clark. Um, several of my students have been taking the transformation of everyday life in Britain, and, and they love it. You know, it's where you get to engage with kind of our recent past in Britain in, in a much more in-depth way. But also a number of advanced topics that perhaps not so focused on, on, on primary sources also range uh, widely, as you, as you can see there. And all of this is in our pamphlets and in our website, so don't really have to, to, to memorize it. So how do we do this? Well, now teaching takes place in between the faculty here, the, the building and the site that, 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 you, that you see, and in college. Here in the faculty, we tend to do the lectures, which is sort of larger rooms like this, bigger, uh, uh, bigger groups, but also quite a lot of the seminars of 15 to 20. But then in the college, you will have a lot of, uh, probably more hours than, than anything else will be based in the college in small groups of uh, supervisor with one-to-one -one with a supervisor or in a small group of two or three, depending on the paper. And that can be in the college that you end up at, or it can be supervisors in different colleges. But that's organized there. And that's where you do most of your weekly work, apart from attending lectures writing essays, uh, talking about uh, the subject, getting feedback, developing new skills. A lot of that is done in that, that very close interaction, which is great. I love teaching that way because it means I can tailor what I'm teaching and my support for students according to everyone's strengths and weaknesses because everyone is different. Someone might be great at one thing and need support in something else. And by having that close relationship, I can tailor what I'm doing to, to that end. Uh, and you'll be working in unparalleled uh, library facilities. Here in the Sealy Library, very popular with our students, is a lovely space, bright and airy, but also a range of college libraries that go from you know, the ancient and, uh, and traditional to the beautiful modern college library. If you happen to be anywhere, uh, go and see it. It's prize winning, just opened last year. I'm not a modern college, so I'm not biased, it's a lovely place. Or the university library. Um, and as I was saying, you know, we hope that we can uh, help you develop uh, a set of skills that are going to be valuable in whatever you decide to do in your life after university. And as I'm sure you're aware, employers highly value our Cambridge graduates but really not because of its name, not because of tradition. You know, employers want people who are skilled, who are confident, who are able to fulfill their potential. And that comes from you. It comes from you and a little bit with our help. And hopefully that combination is what continues to make Cambridge attractive to employers. And people go on to, there isn't a typical uh, career path after history, people go on to do all kinds of things, uh, from, from law to the civil service to NGOs to finance. Really, it is a, it's a foundational degree that opens up a lot, a lot of doors. A lot of people go on to further study, particularly uh, master's degrees, but not necessarily even in history. I've got students going on to do business MAs, going to do heritage and conservation MAs, or even doing literature and film, 
and, and some of them during history. And we have a very, very uh, a kind of leading career service that helps and advises students throughout their degree about how they might want to tailor what they do in the, in the three years that they're here towards uh, finding the kind of career that they want. Um, okay, briefly, uh, history and politics. Essentially, you can you combine the core teaching in politics, which is the modern state and international conflict order and justice, with one history outline, as well as a dedicated course that's only for history and politics students, where the skills and the debates in both history and political science are brought together in the first year. And again, and then in the second year, you have a range of options where people can lean more towards politics or, his, or history in both uh, in, in that year and in the third year, where the mix of subjects is quite, papers is quite open as long as you have to have at least one in each side. Uh, similarly in modern languages, you can see the, here the range of languages that people can, can bring, including uh, many of them ab initio, that is from scratch, uh, and where also you're combining the languages that, that you're taking with one or two history papers in every year. So the combinations here get more complicated. I don't need to run through all of them. We can come back to them if you have questions. Um, but again, one unique feature of the History of Modern Languages degree is the year abroad, which is at the moment only possible in the history of modern languages, where every student spends a year uh, in, in, a, in a different country developing their language, or in several different countries developing their language, and writing a, a year abroad uh, project before coming back and again mixing the, the, the papers from both sides of the degree in whatever combination they want. Okay. Now for uh, application selection, these are our ratios of applicants to places. Historical, they might change next year, we don't, we don't know. And the selection is entirely based on the examination record, predicted marks, uh, and on uh, interviews, which in some, in some colleges may require a, a interview assessments or other forms of, of pre-assessment. None of these require any specific preparation. Uh, and really, uh, we, we, what we are looking for is your take on things. Don't try and prejudge and, and overthink what might be looked at. Just use your brains, the brains that you have, and be flexible in thinking and opening, open to looking at issues from multiple perspectives. Uh, and interviews are only one part of this. It's, it's uh, you know, Short of, of throwing a mug of tea in the face of, of your interviewer, I don't think the, the interview is ever going to be the one thing that's going to decide uh, uh, the success or not of an application. It's part of a much wider set of information that colleges have at their disposal to make difficult decisions, and they're very marginal decisions, uh, between uh, the people who are offered places and people who are not offered places. Uh, and, of course, you know that you have uh, more information on, on all of these entry requirements uh, on and on our degrees uh, here uh, in various links. These are available, I think, in your packs and in the other information that you've been given. Great. Thank you. I've probably overran a little bit. Um, <laughs> we have time for questions. And just for uh, those watching in the other rooms, I will be coming, after I finish here, I'll come up to room 11 to answer more questions in person because people in the other rooms don't have a chance to ask them. So, questions? Yes? Um, you said on the previous slide, you could analyze, those, you could analyze evidence and uncover the unknown. What does that mean? Uh, well, essentially, that's, for instance, in a research project, in a dissertation, or even in your, uh, in your uh, weekly essays, you might have questions about, you know, I'll give you an example. Many years ago, in this university, I did my undergraduate dissertation on uh, the Black Death. 
And I was particularly interested in trying to find ways of modeling what the impact might have been in different parts of the country. And actually, my supervisor said, well, nobody had done that, but there's this guy here that tried it in a very small place. Why don't you try and do it in other villages and other regions of the country? That involves me going to archives and finding evidence and sources which I could use to then analyze and say, well, with this kind of data, I'm making hypotheses that the likely impact of the Black Death was much greater in East Anglia than it was in, say, Yorkshire. For that, nobody had sort of done that before. You know, it hasn't revolutionized the world. I, I'm yet waiting for my Nobel Prize in history, which doesn't exist. But it was something that I created for myself. I, I, it was a question I was interested in. With the help of my supervisor, I found sources nobody had looked at. And I found a method that to analyze those, and I could produce what felt like a little bit of contribution to knowledge. And that can be on any topic that I want to choose, as long as you find someone who's, who's willing to advise you. And there's a lot of us. Um, when it comes to the admission process, so you said interviewing isn't like a very big part of it. Is there things like an admissions test, say, for history in Oxford, Cambridge? Uh, well, this is there are different types of assessments, and some colleges do different things. There, there can, there might be an assessment that you're asked to do in, in your own time at home, or sometimes when you come into the interview, they might say, "What well, at the start of the interview, look at this source or look at this text and give us a commentary." So is it like dependent more on the college? Well, it's more, it's more dependent on the college. Really. And how is that used? That's used as part of that whole contextual information where they're looking at your past grades, at your predicted grades, at your statements, at your teacher's statements, at the conversations that you had at the interview. And overall, they're going, well, you know, all these people are great, you know, but we have to decide because we've got more applicants in places, how are we going to rank them? And all those bits of information go into that. And not one of them is determined. I know you just sort of one thing. <laughs> how much weight do you put on the purple staining in comparison to the other aspects? Um, it varies. I can't speak for everyone. Uh, I find it very helpful because it gives me a sense of an applicant's interests where they're coming from in terms of what they might want to do, what they what particularly <laughs> drives them in terms of engagement with this. Uh, but I also realize they're written quite a few months before you end up at an interview. And at this age, people change and their interests change very dramatically. So it's fine. And sometimes I have applicants saying, I know I wrote that in my personal paper. Actually, since then, I really got into X. You go, okay, let's run with that. You know, it's it's not again. None of these things are, are determined by by not themselves. But it gives us something to go on to try and understand where you're coming from. So it's worth spending time on it. Definitely. Can I ask a question about the propaganda posters you were showing earlier? Which ones? The ones with like um, Italy, Russia. Yeah. And Germany. Yeah. You know the middle one with Russia. What do you think that's supposed to that the spies means? Uh, I do know. What do you think it's? I mean, okay, so I do the English A level. Yeah. So we have dystopia. Yeah. And we say that it means like the control of the mind. Um, well, that's 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 an interpret a perfectly valid interpretation because you are going beyond what they're saying. What and trying to think the mindset that's created in a totalitarian society to try and achieve the full mobilization <coughs> of resources of workers stuff. In a way, that's what they're trying to say. So they're saying, you know, this is the kind of uh, achievement in terms of output, and this is, of course, entirely fictional. In 29 and 30 and 31 and 32, uh, it's, it's two and two if we just look at it like that. But if we put our extra commitment, if you go beyond what's asked of you, two and two can make five. I think that's the message of the poster. But it's part, you know, it's part of a much wider system of propaganda. I am not an expert on, on, on Soviet Russia, but I am uh, interested, uh, including the glorification of worker heroes like Stepanovich, 
the, the worker is supposed to have worked so hard that he killed himself for the good of the nation in terms of, in terms of overwork, is the attempt to mobilize workers to, to, to create this utopia that turns out to be extinct. That poster kind of completely threw me as well. How much do you think, when it comes to the novels, like 1984, I think, is probably the one that we're getting at here. How much do you think their usage of the phrase 2 plus 2 equals 5 comes from the communist posters? Because I'm assuming this also comes down to the fact that that five-year plan was completed in four years. And how much of it is... So how much of it is the dystopian novels being influenced by the Soviet posters? How much might be the Soviet posters being influenced by the dystopian novels? You've just come up with an historical question. So why not write a project or a dissertation on what was Orwell reading and what was he learning about the Soviet Union that might have fed into his writing in 1984? Go back. Um, if you were to switch your film or draw into Russian history or Chinese history, would you be at a disadvantage if you were to speak those languages? No. Uh, there are the, all of our courses that, um, that are about anywhere in the world are entirely designed so you can take them without having the language. There are two small exceptions, which are two of the sources papers. They are designed to be taken by people who have French and German, but there's only two out of 18, I think. Yes. Um, however, I think learning a language is, is a great thing, or developing further a language is a great thing. And we also have one thing we didn't mention. We have a university language centre where on top of your courses and papers, many students opt to either start a new language or, or develop one that they were already doing it uh, uh, earlier in school. And that's something you can do here as alongside your degrees. So, sorry, just to clarify about the admissions process. So is there is there anything similar for any colleges to like a pre-admissions, uh, sorry, a pre-interview test like the opt Um Now, this is where I need to, uh, it's where I need to, uh, it would be great if I had Caroline here, because we have had in the last few years, and I think we still have, we have a pre-admissions test. And I think, I'm not wrong, that's still going to be the case for most colleges will be doing the same pre-admissions test that's then marked centrally, and that information is available to all the, all the interviewers. Um, but do check, double check on that, because it's been, there's been a lot of debate about which colleges are doing it, whether everyone's doing it or not, so, and I don't know what the final decision has been. Regarding personal statements, you alluded to the balance being between like breadth and depth, like what should... It should be... You know, there is not one way of engaging with the past. You know, there's the, the, the sort of the, um, the Isaiah Berlin parable of the hedgehog and the fox. You know, that there are people whose approach to knowledge and their interests are very focused, and that's fine. And there are people who like to connect to many different points. Both are essential if we're going to create knowledge. So your personal statements to exactly that should reflect your approach. If your thing is, you know, Roman coins, you know, go for it. But if you're winterous, if you have many things you're interested, again, have have the person's statement reflect you, not what you think you do. Yes. Um, given that I, I would guess that most A level topics are fairly Western based and Eurocentric. In first year, if you decide to then choose less Eurocentric topics, are they really what sort of introductory? All of them, you know, the I think what you have to realise is the way that we are doing history, and I even hesitate to say teaching, because it's really kind of a co-production between us as teachers and you as engaged students, is very different from the kind of history that you get at A level. So in any way, all of it is introductory. Our first year is meant to be to take you from the start and sort of develop the kinds of skills from scratch that you need to succeed at university. So, and that's true for world history, British history. You know, when I arrived here, I had never studied British history, for instance, because uh, I came from a different country, but they're all designed so that anyone can tackle them without any prior knowledge uh, of, of the subject. Yeah, go back. Yes. 
Yeah, I'm just going to repeat your question because they might not uh, have heard it there. So, yes, you can do languages even if you're not doing kitchen modern languages, but you do them through the University Language Center. So it's not part of your degree. It's not, anyway, it's not for credit in a way as part of your degree. It's something that you do additionally. Yesterday, no, literally, uh, in, in quite a few of our papers, we end up, we have quite an open end, the ones that come to the 20th, 20th and 21st century, we have quite open-ended at the end, and often the conversations and the essays and the discussions end up talking about uh, impacts or connections between things that we're living now and, and the recent past, as well as the distant past. I teach at Trinity Hall, but it doesn't make any difference. All of us are attached to college, but we teach students from every college. So if there isn't someone who is a medieval historian or an economic historian or a historian of South Asia, and that's what you want to do, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't choose the college that you want, because your director of studies will always find a person to teach you in those areas, even if they're in another college. For a different course somewhere else in the language and training, do you think you'd be at a disadvantage? No. We're just glad that you applied to this course here. So, just again to repeat the question from the microphone. Uh, whether in, a, in an interview you'll be asked questions, say, about source or about something that's outside the, the remit of what you've studied. It could be. But if it is, it doesn't require any previous knowledge. That's an important thing. Yes, you might be confronted with things that you, you haven't looked at before, but the, the interviewers also know that you haven't studied in your A-level course. Uh, you could say, I haven't studied this, but I think X, Y, and Z. What they're looking for is seeing how you take in the information, how you process it, and how you think about it, even if it's unfamiliar to you. Any more questions? If not, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm going up to you through 11.